All right, it looks like we're live. Good morning. Thank you for joining our webinar. My name is Mona Bormitt, and I'm the Program Director at Christian Connections for International Health, otherwise known as CCIH. We are an international network of 150 Christian organizations. About 50% have headquarters in the United States and 50% in other countries. And our mission is to promote health and wholeness from a Christian perspective. And CCIH is the co-chair of the Faith Subcommittee for the International Conference on Family Planning. And we are glad you are joining us today for this webinar on family planning with some of our colleagues that work on these issues in other countries. The faith community made historic progress at the 2016 International Conference on Family Planning when 85 faith leaders from 26 nations came together for the first ever faith pre-conference. Um, we discussed best practices and faith-based involvement in family planning and committed to scaling up services to help families with healthy timing and spacing of pregnancies. Maintaining this momentum for the fifth ICFP in November of 2018 in Kigali, Rwanda is critical to us to keeping faith-based organizations on the forefront as crucial partners with governments and other NGOs. And we would like to take today to highlight just a few of the successes from different faith perspectives that have happened since the 2016 ICFP. We have also created a map that will highlight a few organizations who have been working hard within their I got disconnected, so sorry. <laughs> um, I'm gonna move forward and introduce Dr. Ragab, who's based in Cairo, Egypt. Dr. Ragab is a professor of reproductive health at the International Islamic Center for Population Studies and Research at Al-Azhar University. He's also the vice chairman of the Faith to Action Network, the chairman of the Family Culture Committee, of the Egyptian Family House and a member of FP 2020's reference group. So I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Ragab um, and let me make sure to un unmute him so that he is ready to go. So welcome Dr. Ragab. Oh, thank you, Mona. Um, I know we are in different places with different times. So good morning for those who are in the morning, good afternoon and uh, good evening. Uh, in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about how faith-based community can promote family planning and their reproductive health programs. Next. Next. Uh, um, as introduction, as you know, throughout uh, the world, religious leaders are looked to for guidance and advice on all aspects of life. Networking with the religious leaders gives them the sense of ownership. And uh, this uh, consequently um, um, improves their acceptance and ensure more sustainable program, uh, programs. In fact, religious leaders need to own the programs. Next. Uh, however, there are some challenges in including uh, religious leaders in uh, our uh, activities as faith-based com community. Uh, first is misunderstanding of the religious teachings. And uh, le let, allow me to talk uh, particularly about Islamic religion, because the current Muslim uh, religious leaders tend to copy the classical scholars whose, uh, while we are respecting very much their wisdom and the courage, their information were based on the medical information available to them uh, at their time. Uh, having uh, the donors uh, supporting some programs give a sense of conspiracy among the religious leaders. And I can give you some statements like, why we have a lot of problems. We have shortage of food, we have shortage of water, we have lack of schooling, lack of education. While uh, the donors are pouring a lot of money in areas like eradication of female circumcision and family planning, uh, they want to control our population and they want to promote uh, promiscuity by uh, eradication of female uh, circumcision. 
This is amalgamated by the lack of reproductive health knowledge. They do not know uh, the anatomy and the physiology and the basics of uh, reproductive health. So their rules and uh, their opinions uh, could be incorrect and uh, misinterpreted. Uh, uh, lastly, the negative impact of internet satellite channels and social media, which was infiltrated, were infiltrated by fundamentalists, fundamentals and uh, co conservative groups, and they are they are uh, uh, spreading their um, ideas and recruiting um, uh, many to be later in their life terrorists and believe me i wonder why the second and third generation of those who are have been or uh, have been born in europe and uh, western countries turned to be terrorists by these groups next next um, so what face based community can do First is the language, because sometimes the language is uh, threatening and incentives, insensitive. Uh, for, for example, family planning was taken by many as family limitation. So we tried um, some other uh, terminology like birth spacing, uh, but uh, this is also proved not to be successful. So Azhar University adopted a terminology uh, or a definition of family planning that include both birth spacing and the infertility treatment, which ensure uh, reproductive justice and give more acceptance to family planning and counteract the conspiracy theory. Also, faith-based community can recruit experts from uh, several disciplines and by uh, the religious leaders, they consider them the the source of information uh, for them and they respect their opinions in islam they call it ahl zikr means the most knowledgeable experts uh, those experts can spread the word they can do sensitization awareness raising uh, uh, training and so on and i think we need to start early by educating and raising the awareness of students of religious uh, uh, religious schools. The students of today will be the leaders of tomorrow. Uh, there is a cost-effective approach, which is the training of trainers. We have, for example, 50,000 mosques in Egypt. We cannot uh, we can, we can be, not be able to train 50,000 religious leaders, but if we can train 500 and those 500 go around and train others and so on, we can train uh, those uh, groups. Next. This is, uh, this is training of trainer. Uh, as, as you see, those are senior religious leaders and they are sitting in groups because there is a lot of working groups inside this training. Next. This is also female religious leaders. And we need, as a faith-based community, to concentrate more on the female religious leaders. Because women tend to uh, ask the wives of the male religious leaders to ask their husbands. Now, by having the female religious leaders, they do not need to have a mediator. The, they can ask directly the female religious leaders. Next. Uh, this is a step down workshop, where is the, uh, those who gradu are graduates from the training of trainers uh, programs can train others. This is in one of the uh, lo local uh, villages in rural Egypt, who are, where the, the, this who was uh, trained at Tel Azhar uh, was training uh, others. This is the first uh, trials are supervised and monitored by the experts I mentioned before. Next. Those are the students and uh, actually in all the programs, the evaluation and the monitor should be built in part. They are filling the pre-test questionnaire. Uh, then, after the seminar or the workshop, 
we have another post test to evaluate the impact of this program. Next. This, uh, this is female students seminar. Next. Actually, uh, there is one component which we experienced with the face uh, to action and before with UNFBA and with WHO, which is called traveling seminars or caravans. Um, since 2016, we did uh, in Egypt, Indonesia, Somalia, Nigeria, Sudan, Kenya, and Djibouti. And I'm go going to give you uh, Kenya as an example. Next. Uh, first, the experts, the members of the caravan, go and meet the uh, uh, and partner with the authorities, local authorities. They visit the governor and uh, uh, all the authorities to gain support of the task and ensure its success and sustainability. Community mobilization. Actually, in Kenya, they tried several approaches, like uh, Tok Tok with the, the sign of the uh, seminars and the aim of the uh, caravan, and the donkeys in one of the islands called Dilemo Island. And uh, we, first, we network with the senior religious leaders in the region because, as I said, they need to own the program. With the senior religious leaders, we conduct the training of religious leaders. Side by side, we raise the awareness of the uh, co community and uh, we should uh, have some materials to be used later. So we tailor materials to be suitable for each uh, country according to its priority. Next. This is uh, the Kenya caravan. It was in collaboration with SOPCOM and the Supreme Council of Olama in, uh, in uh, Kenya and Face to Action. And this is in one of the big mosques there. Next. Uh, this is in Darfur camps in Eastern Chad. And uh, they actually, the uh, refugees need uh, traveling seminars and the caravans. They have a lot of problems. Uh, even they are refugee, they break the harmful uh, traditions inside the camp itself. Next. One uh, one major task could be study tours. So we, ca we can arrange study tours to uh, countries with proven successful programs like Indonesia and Egypt can be from three to one week. Uh, this is not just for exchange of experience and the gaining uh, knowledge and uh, 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 correction, correction of the misbeliefs and wrong information, but also can be incentives for uh, those individuals who are uh, having a large contribution. Next. Uh, this is Nigerian delegates uh, visiting Al, Al Azhar, uh, Egypt. Next. What areas we can work in uh, as faith based community? Because all these areas have texts in the religion, and we can use the religion to promote them, like promoting family planning, promoting the children development, the health and the protection, which needs family planning to be, to ensure their health, promoting the breastfeeding and the exclusive breastfeeding, promoting the safe motherhood, eradication of harmful traditions like young age at marriage, child marriage, and the female genital mutilation, promoting immunization, vaccination, reduce gender-based violence, promoting reproductive health for adolescents. All these areas, face-based uh, face approach can be very successful. Next. Actually, uh, I'll conclude by these uh, suggestions, and I am working on uh, on uh, this in uh, in Egypt. Premarital counseling now it is mandatory in uh, many countries. Face-based organizations can compile, and I think face to action can lead in this. Can compile a package that includes moral and the medical instructions side by side, and the boot family planning as a central th theme. Actually, we can. 
uh, highlight the value of family planning for happy family life. An initiative by the Egyptian Family House and actually by the committee which I chair, it is targeting mothers in order to raise and discipline their children well. It is called in Arabic, Rabbihum Sah. Part of the package could be uh, the value of child spacing for their health and for uh, the children's health and intelligence and well-being. I thank you very much and I thank CCIH and Fist to Action for this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Raghav. Um, I really appreciate you sharing about the importance of engaging many different parts of the faith community, from students and youth to women and men also, and meeting people where they're at. So I encourage people, if you have questions, to put them in the chat box. Um, and for now, we'll ask uh, Big Big Chua, who's the Executive Director of Catholics for Reproductive Health in the Philippines. Um, to speak. It is a group that endeavors to bring Catholics into full harmony with their faith. Um, and we're grateful that Bic Bic is joining us where it is late at night in the Philippines. So Bic Bic, it's your turn. I'll ask you to remember to unmute yourself and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mona. Uh, greetings from the Philippines, Mabuhay. It's an honor to be able to share with you our advocacy in promoting sexual and reproductive health and rights in a very restrictive environment, largely influenced by misconceptions and religious conservatism. Let me walk you through the content, context of our advocacy, starting with our country situation, the challenges of the universal access to reproductive health, and how C4RH addresses the cultural and religious aspect in promoting SRHR uh, through the interfaith approach with human rights perspective. Next, please. C4RH, as mentioned by Mona, is uh, we aim to bring Catholics into full harmony with their faith and realize that there shouldn't be dissonance with their being Catholic and simultaneously believing in the advocacy and goals of the reproductive health. Uh, we are the members, uh, Catholic members, will remain loyal to the church but continue providing RH education and services to those who truly need them. We also believe in the primacy of the conscience and encourage fellow Catholics to educate themselves and develop mature conscience in discerning their situation and actions. Um, and we do this through education and capacity building, advocacy campaign, community outreach service, and interfaith initiative. Next, please. So in terms of country context, next. The Philippines as a nation has its charms and contradictions. It is well endowed with natural resources. As an archipelago in Southeast Asia with 7,641 islands, including the 13 million hectare Benham rice uh, that is rich in natural gas and other heavy metals. Uh, the Philippines is said to be the fifth most mineral rich country in the world for gold, nickel, copper, and chromite. Currently, Philippines is the world's leading producer of nickel. It is one of the 10 most biologically mega diverse countries in the world. Indeed, our country is blessed with nature's wonder. On the other hand, despite the nature's gift, our biodiversity is also a hot spot where rampant logging and mining threaten our environment. Next, please. And we have to contend with worrisome realities of high incidence of poverty, large population, millions of out of school children and youth, high teenage pregnancy rate, unplanned and unwanted pregnancies, high maternal mortality, uh, an unsafe abortion, and we are having a fast and furious HIV and AIDS uh, case situation. Next, so in terms of our advocacy challenges, next. every day we are confronted with these realities, and yet it pains us to see that oppositions mostly coming from the religious conservative blocs have aggressively campaigned against the full implementation of the reproductive health tool. 
uh, since the signing of the RPRH law on December 21, 2012, uh, in, that was about um, six years ago, uh, nearly. Uh, imagine 2013 to 2014 for two years, the Supreme Court granted the status to Ante as if there was no law passed. And fortunately, only in 2014 did the Supreme Court affirm its constitutionality, but had to strike down eight provisions uh, revolving around consensus objection and uh, the need for consent from spouses and minors. Also in December 2015, there was a one billion lush budget of the Department of Health supposedly for the contraceptive supplies. Again, two more years later, in 2015 to 2017, we had the temporary restraining order on the contraceptives. It prevented our uh, Food and Drug Authority from registering contraceptive supplies and devices, and also our Department of Health from procuring, selling, distributing, dispensing uh, implants. So for two years, we had to rely primarily on the private providers for implants and other contraceptive supplies. Next, please. So, we have a presidential enigma. Uh, President Duterte is very supportive of the RH law. However, his controversial and misogynistic comments against women and highly violent handling of the drug problems, among others, have confused many of his allies. He also reappointed a health secretary known for his support for natural family planning method only. Next, and we have the consensus objection, which is a freedom accorded to healthcare providers to refuse RH information and services to, uh, uh, to their clients. However, that becomes problematic when consensus objector happens to be a government official, as in the case of the Sorsogon mayor, uh, or a government healthcare provider or a municipal health officer because they are all mandated to serve all Filipinos regardless of religion. Uh, while we are 80% Catholics, we're not 100% Catholic. So they have to remember that. Uh, next slide, please. So next. So what we did, we organized uh, the Interfaith for Dignity, Equality, Advancement, and Solidarity, or IDEAS. Since many of the RH resistance is brought about by lack of information, misconceptions, many of which are religious in nature, uh, C4RH reached out to faith-based organizations. We found out that FBOs are just as eager to participate and engage in conversations on FP and RH when they are linked with other social justice issues like poverty, gender inequality, public health concerns like mentioned earlier, like maternal mortality, teenage pregnancies, HIV and AIDS, unsafe abortions, and many more. Uh, interfaith partnership also provides alternative voice and important counterweight to religious conservative Catholic views on FP and SRHR. Uh, for the for our project, uh, funded by the Faith to Action Network, we did uh, the initial scanning of religious leaders in the country uh, regarding their perceptions and positions on uh, SRHR. We did some consultations with church leaders and some ecumenical groups. We also conducted workshops, discussions as input for their planning and integration in their pastoral congregational programs. And towards the end, we have a regional interfaith gathering. Next slide. So uh, for the interfaith, uh, the ideas is actually a collective aspiration of different faith communities and even spiritual groups to address family well-being and other RH concerns. Uh, it was organized to encourage uh, support from religious leaders and faith-based organizations. Uh, for our initiative, we were able to uh, gather and uh, secure the support of 32 leaders from eight regions, 12 provinces, uh, representing eight churches and faith uh, groups in the country. Next slide. 
So these are the pictures, uh, some uh, pictures of the capacity building workshops we did. Next slide. Uh, we also some uh, we also conducted a compassion mission. Uh, these are some of the pictures. Uh, whenever opportunity arises, we partner with different organizations from the national to the local organizations, government agencies and units, academe, grassroots. Uh, we find this very effective, not only in terms of resource sharing, but also expanding our reach and influence. And also in the process, our partners are transformed from being allies into champions and advocates themselves. Next slide. Um, in our interfaith, these are the pictures of the interfaith gathering. Uh, we were able to gather 100 delegates from different churches and religions. Uh, that was last year. Um, uh, pictured here are leaders of the two big churches in attendance, the Iglesia Filipina Independiente and the United Church of Christ in the Philippines. Uh, for the lessons learned, we realize that it is very important to know your religious leaders. Uh, we have to work with their uh, messengers when establishing contact and relationship. We need to be very clear in finding common ground. And we have to be honest and, uh, you know, uh, in terms of pooling resources. And one thing we realize also is that we need to tap the expertise of the religious leader, especially in answering uh, questions uh, about uh, theology and religious practices. Um, uh, in, in our case, we are just starting in building a broader and more inclusive interfaith, interreligious and interspiritual platform for people of faith to talk about sexual and reproductive health and rights. As of now, we are seeing churches starting the conversations in their parishes. Some have advocated for the inclusions of women's concerns and family well-being uh, into their parish concerns. Some even piggyback the RAs in their local campaigns and ecumenical activities. To continue and scale up, we would be needing support for the next level of engagement. And with these leaders, faith leaders uh, with whom we have touched through ideas. I think that would be it. Thank you very much. If you need some question, you can just contact us through the uh, details uh, on your screen. Ramin, salamat. Thank you, Bic -Bic. Um, So many diverse partnerships. I really appreciate you sharing um, how you're working with interfaith partners to reach and build champions. And I agree that honesty um, and respect needs to be built and the expertise of the religious leaders is crucial um, in order to engage them, in order to build and make sure that women's health and family health and well-being um, are considered more seriously in, in all churches and all faith communities, so thank you. Um, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Um, and for those of you who are joining us, please include any questions you have in the chat box in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. But our next speaker is Mr. Peter Munene from the Faith to Action Network. He has 21 years experience in advocacy and implementation and is based in Nairobi, Kenya. He is also the co-chair of the International Conference on Family Planning Faith Subcommittee with me. Um, and so I'd like to welcome Peter and like to make sure he is unmuted so we are ready to go. So welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Mona. And uh, thank you very much, Big Big and uh, Professor Ragab. This is a great opportunity that we have today I know greetings have been passed, but I'll say good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all who are joining us in this webinar. And uh, I want to say thank you very much to uh, Professor Agap and uh, Big Big for sharing what they have done in their respective countries and beyond in relation to promotion of uh, family planning. I would say that in uh, the faith community in relation to the international conference on family planning has had different levels of participation the last uh, three the conferences the last three international conferences on family planning that is the one in 2011 in uh, senegal the one in uh, 2013 in addis ababa ethiopia 
and the one in uh, 2016 in Indonesia. And from my side, I would say, I, I will use an analogy to say that in those three uh, international conferences on family planning, what the faith community did uh, through different efforts, uh, including the faith pre-conference that we had for the first time in 2016, was more preparing the ground and planting the seeds. But we have also sort of amazed ourselves from what we have seen people achieve out of those initial efforts that we've done. And Mona has shared the map of uh, some of the organizations and what they have achieved through the advocacy efforts that they have done after the Faith Peak Conference in 2016. It is not uh, uh, limited to one uh, particular region. It, it is a, a global representation of what has been happening after the, uh, the, the Faith Peak Conference during the International Conference on Family Planning in 2016. So what, what are we trying to do moving forward? And especially in relation to the International Conference on Family Planning uh, 2018, which will take place in Kigali, Rwanda. We are going to, we are trying to organize and mobilize the faith community to be active through a faith pre-conference that we are planning to have on, uh, uh, that we plan to have on the 10th and the 11th of, of November, as well as participation of the faith community uh, in the International Conference on Family Planning through different sessions that will be taking place, but especially through promoting the faith track, which is the faith track on uh, faith and family planning track 13. And we are encouraging a lot of uh, faith community to submit abstracts, individual as well as panel abstracts for presentation in different aspects. We are also trying to, uh, we are also advocating for a plenary session uh, speaker during the International Conference on Family Planning, the plenary sessions that we have. Next. So uh, the faith pre-conference that we are planning to have uh, will have a major component of advocacy training. And this time around, uh, in 2016, we had about over 80, 80 participants attending the faith pre-conference. This time around, we want to make it more concrete by providing a day's training on advocacy to a select number of faith leaders that uh, uh, specific uh, leaders who are who will be selected with a, with a very clear criteria and who will be coming from different religions different denominations of different faiths and for this we are requesting partners out there to partner with us to join us and support us with a hundred thousand us dollars which we have done a budget for that will, will enable these faith leaders to be uh, together and have this training on the 10th of november this will cover their their ranches this will cover their 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 teas this will cover their materials this will cover their, uh, their their transportation. This will cover their accommodation, but also it will cover uh, the element of staff time. Staff time because it involves a lot of staff uh, uh, staff time. It takes a lot of staff time to organize and plan for this particular um, event. Next. We are also going to have a reception and an interfaith prayer event on Sunday the 11th. And uh, I, I believe for many people, they might ask themselves, why uh, do we want to have a, a prayer event? We know uh, the history of Jan Rwanda. We know the, the, the happenings of the countries in the region. We know about DRC. We know about uh, what is happening in, uh, in Burundi. We know what has happened in Uganda. We know what has happened in Southern Sudan. And a number of the, including uh, what is happening in Somalia, and a number of the countries in the region. And as faith 
as a, as, as a community of faith. For us, we feel it is our duty when we are in Rwanda to bring together different faith groups and have an interfaith prayer for peace, because we know also how security affects family planning. So this is a very, very important event, although it might sound a bit outside of what people are used to in an, in an international conference on family planning. And for this, we are requesting partners to help us uh, with the, the rent of the space, the food that will will be served, and uh, the staff time with uh, with fifteen thousand uh, US dollars. Next, next. Um, the the other level of participation is through in the entire conference, which starts on uh, the 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 twelfth going forward to the 15th. And within this particular uh, level of participation, we are we are we have estimated that we'll we'll need 100,000 US dollars. So actually in total we need 215,000 US dollars. But this this again will cover uh, cost of the of of bringing together the the, the participants, the the that faith religious leaders of uh, in terms of flights, in terms of hotel, in terms of registration for the conference, in terms of uh, staff time, and and other 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 uh, other costs that that would would be for the logistics of bringing these people together. What we what what I what I would want to say at this particular point is that what we have realized is that this is a an investment that yields actual dividends. Actual dividends, and uh, if you have uh, if you look if you have looked at the the map that map Mona has shared, the one that we are uh, launching today, on which which shows what the faith community has done after the day, you can see that that investment is worth it. So what we are we are kindly requesting uh, partners to join us and be able to make us uh, to make this particular event uh, uh, the faith pre conference and the participation of the faith in the entire conference a reality. This is not um, a one or two organization or organizations effort. It's a joint effort of many organizations. Next. We have 27 faith subcommittee members who are the faith, faith subcommittee is a part of the international steering committee is a subcommittee of the international steering committee organizing the icfp so we have 27 faith subcommittee members which is the international group that is trying to organize this and it, again it's spread in uh, in all the continent us africa asia Again, also made up of different organizations that have different levels. Some, I would even call it actually a, a partnership between faith neutral and faith based organizations. Next. But also in Rwanda, we have, uh, as part of the National Steering Committee for the International Conference on Family Planning, a faith subcommittee. And this particular faith subcommittee has 13 members. Uh, we are very, very privileged that the Minister of Health is uh, chairing this particular faith subcommittee, but it has different groups, uh, different representation of different uh, religions and different denominations that have also that are helping in organizing the, the, the faith conference and the participation of the faith in the International Conference on Family Planning at Rocco Revo. So we are working very closely with, uh, with the Faith Subcommittee in Rwanda, and uh, the chairperson is also a member of the International Faith Subcommittee. Next. So this is uh, um, the map of some of the organizations that, are, that we have sampled to show what they have done after the 2016 Faith uh, International Conference on Family Planning. 
And once again, I want to uh, kindly request for your support in enabling us to have uh, the faith subcommittee uh, manage to organize the faith pre-conference, as well as the participation of the faith in different aspects within the International Conference on Family Planning, especially making sure that the faith track 13, faith and, 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 and uh, family planning, will be a success, as well as uh, the faith community also participating in other, other sessions that are not necessarily the faith and family planning uh, track. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everyone. Um, for those of us joining on the webinar, please include any questions in the chat box. I've received a few emails that some people aren't able to. So if you want to email me directly one of your questions, my email is mona.bormit at ccih.org. But we do have a few questions, so I'm going to ask all of our speakers to turn their videos on so we can see your faces um, and unmute yourself. The first question is actually for Dr. Ragab. And so Dr. Ragab, the question is, does Dr. Ragab have any objective evidence that these religious leaders have changed their attitudes towards family planning, female genital mutilation, and other health issues that you mentioned? Uh, actually, uh, due to uh, the presence of several uh, programs and the medicalization of uh, female genital mutilation, which uh, turned that to be more safer from the perspective of the community and uh, that all the assumptions that it is harmful traditions uh, are um, uh, the medicalization uh, disqualified uh, this which uh, is very wrong and actually by medicalization they are doing a lot of harm they are not uh, uh, doing a good thing and uh, they they are uh, violating the ethical uh, principles so uh, to have objective evidence is very hard there is research there is pre and the both test we conduct uh, some uh, as monitor and evaluation tools we conduct some qualitative uh, research uh, we do focus group discussion and we do in-depth interviews. There is change, but you can't uh, measure these changes. Uh, is it for because of the program for the uh, religious leaders or because the programs for the community, because of the impact of the uh, media? Uh, this is you can't. It, it might need a very meticulous methodology in order to detect the impact of face-based approach on female genital. Thank you, Dr. Ragab. Um, we have another question that came in over email. Um, question for everyone, if you want to answer it. The question is, how do the different faith communities or different faiths see the terms SRH and SRHR when some groups define these terms to include abortion? So I think it's a question about language and how do you use and define terms. So um, maybe Bic Bic, can we start with you? Oh, unmute yourself, Bic Bic. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you, Mona, for the question. It's kind of one of the, actually, the issue of uh, concerns that we had in, uh, in one of the conversation topics that we had with the religious leaders, but we go by the definition of the ICPD with regards to sexual and reproductive health and rights. And very recently, we tried to distinguish the sexual health and rights from the reproductive health and rights, just for them to have this sensing where uh, reproductive health um, involves like the reproductive health system, the, the, the functions involved and the sexual health with regards to the sexual relationships even the the need for safe and uh safe and satisfying sexual relationships so that's how we uh that's how our conversations between the years are revolved 
Okay, so does I think the person who was asking was saying some groups think those those terms include abortion. Does that come up or or no? Yes, yes. Actually, it 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 came about when you talk about the the spectrum of rights. It also includes abortion in our, in countries where it is legal. Uh, but in like in our country, it is uh, where abortion is illegal. Um, we do not subscribe to that. But one thing we need to address is the high mortality rate brought about by unsafe abortion, and that becomes a public health concern. It doesn't. Uh, we need to talk about unsafe abortion because a lot of women are dying. A lot of women's uh, health are compromised because of that phenomenon. So uh, it's not denying the realities. We just have to address it. So how do we go about it? One of the uh, resolutions that came out from the conversation is that we need to seriously address the need for uh, addressing the unmet family planning. Hence, the need for the full and comprehensive implementation of the reproductive health law. Okay. Yeah. Well, Big Vic, I'm sure we could talk about that for a lot longer, but I want to I want to give other people the opportunity to answer. Peter, were you going to say something? Yes, I, I was going to say that one of the the those terminologies, sexual reproductive health, sexual reproductive reproductive health and rights, different faiths and different denominations have different perceptions about them. What Faith to Action Network has trying to do is address the issue of value clarification for the different faiths and reach a, a consensus with them on uh, on what it is that we are we are we are we are we are promoting. When we are promoting family planning, we, we have to promote family planning within the roles of that of that particular country. There are the roles that pre uh, prescribe what what is family planning, how is abortion considered as well as the 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 faith the faith of that community of, of that of that community so it is very very important that the two are considered together and any misperceptions that are there are then addressed in terms of uh, what what does uh, family planning include what does sexual reproductive health and rights include consistent with people's faith and also consistent with the national roles and uh, uh, and, uh, and policies. Thank you, Peter. Dr. Ragab, do you have anything to add? Yes, actually, uh, for religious leaders in the Muslim community, there is three tires that uh, govern their uh, opinion regarding abortion. Before 40 days, before 120 days, and after 120 days. Before 40 days, uh, actually, the, uh, the majority of schools allow abortion uh, because of a reason that uh, in order to uh, feed another child, in order to so, uh, but uh, before 120 days, uh, it is uh, the, the reasons should be stronger. After 120 days, it is uh, there is consensus that abortion is uh, prohibited, uh, except to save the mother's life. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, you, you have a sense that the medical doctors are more conservative regarding abortion than the religious leaders them, themselves. Uh, currently, uh, abortion uh, for uh, incest or rape, uh, many allow, and even many religious leaders allow it, and even they call uh, to support them from the cat, which is the money given to uh, charity. Uh, but before uh, 10 years ago, uh, those, uh, those opinions were not open like that and they call for uh, having uh, the, the uh, pregnancy to uh, continue. Uh, for religious leaders, uh, sexual and reproductive health is not a sensitive topic in, in Egypt. Uh, the uh, religious text 
talk about everything, even sexual relations and uh, so on. And I have some articles addressing sexual and reproductive health from Islamic context on the internet. You, you can download it and read it. Mona, I don't know, maybe just a small addition to say that uh, as part of value clarification, we allow scholars, uh, religious scholars, to also identify scriptures that either are all for uh, family planning, uh, issues of sexual reproductive health, issues of sexual reproductive health and rights, and that that helps a lot because uh, we, are, we, we, we finally are able to find out that many of these issues are actually have scriptural scriptural support in terms from the holy books yes from the bible and the quran yeah yes i think i think that to i think the person who asked this question it's a big question it could be talked about for a long time in terms of language and terminology i know from ccih's perspective um we believe we don't really use the terms srhr uh we use the term family planning um healthy timing and spacing of pregnancies. Um, and reproductive health is a much bigger area and family planning is a part of maternal and child health. Um, and we believe that family planning um, helps prevent abortions. So there's more questions. Bic Bic, this question is for you. Mm -hmm. How do you work with the government when the president strongly supports you, but his minister of health believes only in natural family planning? That's very interesting. You see, uh, the our Secretary of Health already said categorically that because our president supports family planning or the implementation of the reproductive health law, he is all for the implementation of the reproductive health law. But you know, uh, that is talk. And in terms of action, we still have to see it because uh, there are some indications by which uh, uh, he he just uh, was appointed. He just was he was just confirmed uh, about a few months earlier, and we have we are watching him. We are watching him if he will be true to his promise that he will implement the reproductive health law as mandated by our government. Okay, thank you, Bic Bic. So we have a lot of questions flooding in over email. So I want I want to move on. Um, the next question is the global family planning 2020 movement seeks to rapidly increase the number of couples practicing family planning are fp 2020 leaders adequately engaging with religious leaders and faith-based organizations to work towards these objectives in your experiences so maybe uh dr Rigata, me, why don't you start <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, being a member of the face based uh, family planning 2020 and uh, also i am uh, um, vice chairman of the face to action so actually uh, family planning 2020 reference group supporting the face based uh, community very much and we have a meeting in nigeria in may and uh, side by side with this meeting, the Rosa Conference for Interface uh, Community for Family Planning. And actually, uh, my experience participating on behalf of Family Planning 2020 in this interface uh, community, it was very, very useful. And I think we should uh, repeat it. And there is um, very progressive Catholics for family planning, which was a surprise to me. Very, very uh, good experiences, very nice programs. And I think Philippines can, uh, can uh, have some sort of exchanging experience with uh, these groups. Yes, there was uh, people for natural family planning, their books, they were promoting, they strongly supporting natural family planning as uh, key to, uh, as 100% uh, successful, which is not true, uh, but uh, side by side, there was those who are supporting uh, modern methods of family planning among the Catholics in this meeting. So uh, I okay. think, uh, Family Blank 2020 is doing its uh, job. Okay. Peter, do you have any additions? And then I'm going to move on to a question for Big Big. I, I think I can say that the 
FP 2020 readers have to do more. <laughs> they have to do more. I agree. I agree. They have to do I more agree. to... to I think one is the, the issue of uh, how maybe they might see the faith community. The faith community, to me, are allies. And I say they are allies in this sense. They, if you are talking about Africa, uh, it has nearly a parallel number of, uh, an equal number of uh, health facilities that they run to those of the government. So already they come in with something on the table. They have the health facilities, they have then the congregation members on where where they can create demand for family planning. I think this linkage and this collaboration needs to be strengthened. It needs to be improved. But I think as of now, I would say they can do more. Yeah, so, uh, I, I agree also, especially in the country there, that we have to talk about. The conversation should be talking about the realities. like. Uh, we shouldn't be afraid to talk about, for instance, uh, family, modern family planning and uh, natural family planning or between uh, abortion uh, and safe abortion because these are realities. So uh, what do we need to do given the realities? And we shouldn't look, be afraid to talk about these issues. And I think FP 2020 can help in our country in providing uh, support for more platform for conversations to talk about uh, contentious issues where faith-based organizations can really, you know, reflect on what is it in our faith that prevents us from reaching out, helping out women who are trying, being stigmatized because they had had abortions, for instance, or they had had failed relationships, you know. So um, I think we can, they can do more in our country. Okay, so Big Big, I have a question for you that someone emailed me. When you encounter resistance to your messaging and engagement on family planning issues in the community, what oh, what have you found to be helpful in dissipating the resistance and building understanding and future support? Um, we, like I said, when we it's you know, the lessons learned that we had in working with religious leaders also work with other people regardless of faith by the way we just have to find that common ground if we be like for instance uh, human dignity when we talk about uh, dignity for men and women for old and young what are our indicators how do we describe it and compare it with their current situation so uh, then from there, once we have agreed that these are the indicators, these are our standards for dignity, then what are the things we can do together in order to improve our situation? So uh, that's where we work around um, in trying to have that conversation. And speaking of conversations, we always affirm that we are not here to debate. Uh, we have moved past beyond debate. We're here to talk about the issues. We're going to talk about how to improve our situation. And if you have some strategy or methodology that can improve the situation, then by all means, we will support you. But for others who would try to do another strategy, then let them be. Because that strategy may be also effective. So we cannot probably cover the entire country or the entire world and have solution for the so many problems. So, so that's where I think uh, would be a good conversation and common ground uh, topic. Okay. Thank you, Big Big. We, we've had a few more questions come in, but unfortunately we've run out of time. So I promise that um, we wanna just thank everyone for joining today's webinar. I wanna thank Dr. Bragab and Big Big and Peter for sharing um, about what faith-based communities are doing and specifically um, a few, just a few examples of what's happened since the 2016 ICFP. The webinar will be available on our YouTube page and we'll send out a link to everyone. We encourage you to please share the recording with colleagues who are unable to join. And we do hope you partner with us to ensure faith voices are heard at ICFP's 2018 conference in Rwanda. Um, and as a reminder, the map that we showed highlights work of other faith-based organizations, of course, because of the, the limited amount of time we could only share 
what a few groups are doing. And the map is not exhaustive of what every faith-based group in the world is doing or what groups are doing with faith communities. Um, if you have additions for the map, please let us know. And any other questions that came in that we were unable to answer, we'll try to include in the, the comment box of the webinar. So we want to thank you for joining us um, and hope everyone has a really wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.